So, Dougal Tyne, thanks very much for joining us on a Midix podcast. Pleasure to be here. We are going to be discussing your book, At Work in the Ruins, which was kindly uh, given to me by Chelsea Green Publishing, which is this book, At Work in the Ruins, is to be published tomorrow, the 9th of February, 2023. Uh, and it is a book about climate change, about science, about pandemics, At Work in the Ruins, the subtitle, Finding Our Place in the Time of Science, Climate Change, Pandemics, All the Other Emergencies. And um, I won't show people the book because the edition I've got is the uncorrected proof, which is not as beautiful as the edition they are going to be buying tomorrow. Um, so Dougald, just tell us a little bit about yourself, why you wrote this book, and yeah, what exactly it is you do. Well, so once upon a time, I was a journalist. I worked for the BBC for a short while and realized pretty quickly that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in newsrooms. And as I set out looking for what I was going to do with uh, however long I had, I, I guess that coincided with a wave of awareness around climate change that was going on in sort of 2005, six, seven. And I got drawn into some of the climate activism that was going on around that time, but also quite quickly into a, a kind of an unease or a dissatisfaction with that, which I couldn't fully articulate. But the conversation through which I began to articulate that was when I ran into this guy, Paul Kingsnorth, who had been the editor of The Ecologist magazine. He was a pretty well-known environmental journalist in the UK at that time. And we were commenting on each other's blogs. That's how we crossed paths. And then he wrote this fabulous post that said, I quit, which was about how he'd reached the end of the line with being a journalist. No longer believed you could do the things with it that were why he had given you know, the first 15 years of his adult life to it. And then right at the end, he said, but I have this idea for this publication that would be different to anything I've been involved in. And he just said a few lines about it. And then he said, and if it's going to happen, then I'm going to need I'm going to need good people to work on this together. And I wrote to him and it turned out it was sort of just the two of us who, who gravitated to this idea he had floated. And out of that came this thing called the Dark Mountain Manifesto, which started a lot of debates, but also started a project with a journal and festivals and lots of other things. And for me, that took me um to all kinds of places often talking to people about climate change sometimes on stages in front of large numbers of people sometimes in small gatherings where climate scientists and artists and indigenous elders and activists were being brought together around this sort of puzzle of how do we get from like what we know intellectually about how big a scary a thing this is to something commensurate with that in terms of what's actually happening in the world and you know further down the line when extinction rebellion and fridays for the future and that new wave of climate movements came along in 2018 a lot of people who were pretty close to the core of that were people i already was in conversation with and so you know i'm not much use as a frontline activist myself but i've been a kind of quiet listening board and conversation partner for a lot of people who have more courage and better judgment when they're under pressure than I do. Mm -hmm. And so I spent quite a bit of time around that. And so this book is really five years on from that, having having hit a strange point during the pandemic, in the second year of the pandemic, when I suddenly heard myself say, maybe it's time to stop talking about climate change. Mm -hmm. And this is the book where I try and work out how the hell that could possibly be true, even if it's just true for me as somebody who has spent a lot of time talking to people about climate change. Well, I do have a couple of questions just before I, you know, ask you the hermetics question. I mean, do you think journalism can be redeemed? Or do you think journalism, you know, that 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 title, that term is basically gone and perhaps something new like that needs to arise? Well, it's clearly kind of in some kind of metamorphosis, partly because of the larger state of institutional authority or its decay. And so we have a lot of activities going on, which at different times might have ridden under the name of journalism, some of which have more life in them than others. We have competing ideas about what authority is like, what trust should be founded on. 
it's a mess right now, but it's an interesting mess. I, in some ways, more interesting than it was at the point where I was realizing that I didn't want to spend my life uh, at the BBC, which was sort of, I guess, 2003 was when I sort of trashed my career there. And then I hung around a bit off and on for a few years. And 2006 was when I left for good. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't regret having chosen not to walk that path. I I know a few people who are journalists for whom it was a genuine vocation in a way that's different to me. So you can do stuff with it. But most of what goes on under the name of journalism is um, did not necessarily did work that I'd be proud to be associated with myself. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, perhaps that sort of idea of walking away, well, that, that idea of walking away from things is, is pretty much sort of almost the kernel of which the book is revolving around. But before we jump in, I, of course, have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? Uh, James, I, I was trying to work this one out and what kind of answer and i ended up being quite selfish i just thought like, who would i really genuinely want to listen in on and there were probably uh, there were sort of three people writers who really helped me find my bearings in my 20s at that point where i had kind of trashed the the beginnings of what had looked like a successful journalistic career mm-hmm. um, one of whom i then got to know pretty well which is alan garner the other two who one of whom died before i ever discovered his work and the other was an old man and i only met him once i'd love to hear them in conversation and that's ivan illich Mm -hmm. who was this kind of radical catholic priest who fell out with the vatican in the late 60s and then became for a while this kind of intellectual rock star in the 70s really really famous for a while and then by the time i discovered him he'd sort of dropped from view Mm. And it, there's a resurgence of interest in Illich in the last 10 years or so, which is great. But I would really love to hear him in conversation with John Berger, mm-hmm. who is kind of known as a Marxist art critic. He did this TV series, Ways of Seeing. He won the Booker Prize and gave half the prize money to the Black Panthers and denounced the source of the money. But for me, it was what he did after that in the remaining 40 years of his life when he settled in this village, in this valley, in the Haute Savoie, in the French Alps and kind of rethought without ever relinquishing his political commitments rethought them in dialogue with the last generation of peasants in western europe Mm -hmm. and it's this journey beyond the logic of progress and the myth of progress that he went on in a very particular way whilst also embodying so much of you know what i love and aspire to as a writer in the way that he told stories and did his thinking in in full view so i would love to hear i know they met at least once but i would love to hear illich and berger in conversation and then i thought who else should be in that room and i thought of my friend caroline ross who's an artist and tai chi teacher and somebody with you know just no intellectual pretensions but actually one of the most brilliant minds and one of the most brilliant people to talk with and think with and she's just finally started putting her writing out into the world uh she has a substack called uncivil savant but i know like what an important conversation partner she's been for me and paul kingsnorth and ian mcgillchrist and all sorts of other people and i just love the idea of caro being in this room with John Berger and Ivan Illich and making them both laugh and oh troubling their thinking and bringing it into the body and all of the things that I can imagine happening in that room so that's that's my that's what I want to be a a fly on the wall for do you see that room as a very grounded room very practical room I imagine it I I imagine the conversation would be happening around a kitchen table Mm -hmm. like they'd probably be chopping vegetables together and cooking together at the same time as as talking yeah it couldn't simply be uh it couldn't simply be too abstract or idealistic it would that have to be something going on yeah Hmm. is there any is there any question or sort of answer that you you think between them you know a strain of thought that you'd like them to approach ah no i just i i would i would love to just hear where that conversation ended up going to be honest Hmm. okay 
yeah, as you say, it's sort of a selfish room. But I think, I think uh, you know, everyone often people answer the question with respect to whatever it is we're talking about. But if you were truly given given the question and you knew it was going to happen, I think most people would probably be selfish. Mm. Mm. Okay, well, diving into your book, if I was to say that, as we've sort of touched on a little bit, but I guess to to unfold the book, so to speak, the ultimate question of the book is why you've stopped talking about climate change as someone who was more, uh, who was deeper into climate change and being serious about uh, getting the word out there and how, how do we how do we slow it down? How do we halt it? What do we even do about this? I mean, I guess that's the question we sort of have to begin with. Why why did you feel that you had to stop talking about it? Well, clearly I've just written a book which has plenty to say about climate change. So there's a kind of, there's an irony in this. And yet the book is in some sense setting down a lot of the work I've been carrying over this sort of 15 year arc from when Paul and I began working on the Dark Mountain Manifesto. And I say at the beginning, I, I've never been the person whose job it is to stand up and explain the facts of climate change and tell people what's happening, or even the kind of practical, and here's the list of things we need to do. Mm. Like My job is to come in somewhere in the middle of that and ask, you know, what does this mean? How does it change things? I, how do we get from a sort of arm's length factual knowledge to an experience of knowing that might leave us changed and might allow us to, to to fathom the implications of this. And uh, when I think about why I've so often, I, why that's so often been where I've been drawn to, I think it has to do with the role that climate change plays or has played for the winners of modernity, you know, the people who are most sheltered from the shadow side of um, the consequences of this much more tangled thing that we call modernity or that Walter Mignolo, the Argentinian decolonial theorist, calls modernity coloniality, because he says you don't get one without the other. They're two sides of the same coin. And so for the people who get to live as if the only side of that coin is the shiny side of it, mm. You know, the people who haven't even experienced that much until very recently of the sense of the failure of the promises of progress within Western societies. Mm. Climate change is often the place where there is a kind of collision with the real mm -hmm. for them, um, a kind of a, a fracturing of the promises and the logic of progress. And the other side of that is... Uh, Alistair Mackintosh, the great Scottish environmental thinker and activist who um, I've learned a huge amount from, said in one of his books on climate change, you know, I have a feeling that climate change has become a chosen trauma um, for some people. A chosen trauma is this thing where, like, you deal with the multiple crises of your life by telling a story that focuses on this one particular trauma that becomes the story you wear as an identity. And Alistair said in in um, Riders on the Storm, it was, uh, he, he thought he saw that happening around climate change. So a whole lot of multiple things that are actually there in the air of our society are passing through like a lightning rod through this you know, justified fear about climate change. Mm -hmm. And where I went with that in the book is I said, I think the reason for that is that the modern parts of ourselves, the parts of us that have been told or have absorbed and embodied the idea that we can only treat something as real if it is measured and presented by scientists, mm. um, like climate change is the place where those parts of ourselves get given permission to feel and talk about this sense of living in a moment that is now, as Paul and I said in the manifesto, it's not the end of the world, but it is the end of the world as we know it. And so that's those are all the reasons why I've you know, spent so much time around climate change in the conversations I've been part of and the work I've done. But what began to come home to me midway through the pandemic was that something was changing for two reasons. One has to do with the pandemic itself or the, the response to it and the politicization of that. 
because uh, any conversation about climate change starts inside this frame of science mm. because climate change is a scientific concept you know what we know about the processes that it refers to is brought to us mainly through the work of the natural sciences but climate change also asks us questions that science cannot answer mm. right? starting with the question of how did we end up in this mess mm. is it a piece of bad luck with the atmospheric chemistry that you know, turns out all that co2 from these fossil fuels we've been emitting increasingly over the last seven generations or so turns out late in the day that it destabilizes the climate system and you know what a piece of misfortune mm. or is it the consequence of a way of approaching the world a way of seeing and treating everything and everyone that would always have brought us to such a pass even if the atmospheric chemistry was different even if the ipcc turned around tomorrow and said guys terribly embarrassing turns out we did our sums wrong mm. and i so that choice between uh, do we make sense of this as a piece of bad luck with the atmospheric chemistry or as a consequence of a way of showing up in the world and treating everyone and everything science can help inform a conversation about that but science cannot answer it for us and in fact that kind of question can't even be framed clearly so long as we're talking as if science can do all of the work of knowing a thing like climate change so that i've been saying for years but what changed in the pandemic is that there's now an electric fence around the borders of science you know belief in science science as a source of overriding political authority has been performed you know, in a way which is not new which has a long history within modernity but with a new intensity and become a kind of fault line down the middle of society between you know the true believers in the covid narrative on the one side and the people who've gone off down you know whatever set of rabbit holes on the other side of it and there's you know probably a lot of us who've actually been kind of quietly puzzled in the middle between those but oh uh, that changes the context for a conversation that if it's going to start with climate change is starting inside the frame of science but needs to go beyond that frame if we're going to ask some of the most important questions and so i'm saying partly you know because of that those of us who want to you know, who want to ask those other questions will need to start by talking about something else something that isn't as easily held inside this frame of science and then secondly as all of this was happening there was this kind of sh shift going on where climate change was rising on the agenda of the world economic forum crowd and the rest of it and coming to the center of the story that people like bill gates are telling mm. and you know there is a there is a way of responding to climate change in which climate change becomes a a source of legitimacy for a project of control and management on an unprecedented do, scale just to just to jump in though do you, yeah do you seriously think that it's become a legitimate concern for any way anywhere near enough people i think that um there is i i think there are a lot of people who are living with a real fear of it living with it in different ways keeping it like as far away from them as possible or really carrying it like in their guts and not knowing what to do about it and i think you know the initial wave of extinction rebellion when it had like 35 percent support in the uk in april um 2019 that was you know that was kind of an that eruption was a reflection of how many people had been waiting for someone to to name this stuff in a way that wasn't like redolent with a kind of false sense of we can fix all of this mm. then that very quickly decays for reasons both internal and external to that particular movement and so on but so yeah i mean obviously in a sense we're not taking climate change seriously enough but it's also um it's like climate change is both too big and too small as a way of talking about the trouble that the world is in it's too big mm. because 
if you have a conversation about it as if it's an ordinary thing, as if we could uh, we could do climate change for next month's issue of the magazine, like that's a category error. Uh, it's like you know treating a continent as something you could lift up and look underneath it. You haven't grasped the kind of thing you're dealing with. But equally, it's so easy because of how scary it is and how urgent it feels when we start talking about climate change to end up talking as if it encompasses the trouble we're in, as if it's the one thing that we need to fix that will determine whether we get the sort of Hans Rosling, Stephen Pinker future <laughs> or whether everything is finished within a generation or two. And it's like, that's not adequate either and can even can even become a kind of way of displacing our attention from trying to grasp the nature of the trouble that the world is in so uh, i don't know if that answered your question there is James. Something, well there, there's something i want to touch on there that you know you, you say the way you phrased it the, uh, the the trouble the world is in and of course to to jump back to what you said about the original manifesto with king's north about the idea of the world won't end, but the world as we know it will end. And do you think perhaps it's a mistake for us to pretend otherwise that climate change as we framed it is really anything else or anything other than our worry about we as human beings won't be able to continue as we are? You know, the world will go on without us completely fine. Like anything we can do, unless we find a way to perhaps fracture the planet in two, the, 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 the earth will go on completely fine. You know, it doesn't really care about like you know it doesn't what can we say about the earth caring for us it would just it would nature would change in whatever way is applicable so perhaps we need to um this is my own opinion and i'll just get your thoughts on it we need to admit to our own um selfishness and say that this this problem is really about us destroying our own habitat and we perhaps need to admit to that a little bit more than this idea of, oh, it's about everything else other than the fact of our lives. Absolutely. I think, um, and it's also about the definition of us. In a sense, it's like modernity is coming down. How much else is it going to take with it? So, yes, you've got, on the one hand, a... Uh, the planet has managed, what is it, five mass extinctions before without our help. So we shouldn't take too much pride in having played a central role in number <laughs> six. And as you say, you know, maybe we will succeed in sterilizing the planet, but probably like most of the other grand projects of modernity, we will fall short of that one too. <laughs> they almost certainly mm -hmm. life goes on. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, you know, the likelihood of creatures like us being around for a good long time to come within that ongoingness is higher than some people seem to be making out. Uh, I've not seen much that convinces me that uh, we're headed for near-term human extinction. But uh, once we, you know, once people move from talking about climate change as a problem to be fixed and managed and solved and so on, so that we get to extend existing trajectories of growth, progress, development, once people flip out of that, they flip into talking about climate change as an existential threat. Mm -hmm. And firstly, that's always pretty anthropocentric. It's always human existence that is uh, at stake there. Mm -hmm. But secondly, there is a kind of switch even within that because existential threat can mean threat to our existence as a species or it can mean threat to a mode of human existence which we have told ourselves is not only the best way of being human together that has ever existed and we are so lucky to have been born at this moment mm -hmm. oh and and you can kind of you can make the case from certain angles for that like there are things that we would not gladly swap about the the ways of living that you and I were born into at the moment that we were born, mm -hmm. even with all of this on the near horizon of all of the trouble around and ahead. It's not just that. It's that the story we've told is that all of human existence up to this point was building towards this. And therefore, it's not just our pieces of luck and you know, achievements around here lately that are in play. It's this human project that, you know, in every TED talk that has one of those upward sweeping curves of whatever it is they're charting, tells us we are 
you know, the the cumulative achievement of every human who ever lived, and it all depends on whether or not we carry this project forward or we're the ones who let it, you know, go under. And that kind of thinking is is really unhelpful, not least because it tends to leave us unable to differentiate between those two senses of existential threat, threat to the biological existence of humans as a species, and more than that, you know, the ongoingness of meaningful human existence, mm -hmm. and threat to the particular mode of existence. And what brought this into focus for me, when we were writing the Dark Mountain Manifesto, I was traveling backwards and forwards between Sheffield and London a lot of the time. And I would stand in the queue at the food store, the Marks and Spencer's food store at Sheffield Railway Station. And they had this corporate social responsibility campaign with this slogan that was on posters behind the checkouts. And it said, plan A, because there is no plan B. <laughs> and week after week, the more I saw it, the more I thought, but wait a minute, for whom? For what is there no plan B? For meaningful human existence or for... You know, this kind of chain that does very nice cheese and pickle sandwiches, which I'm queuing up to pay for? Or are we no longer making the distinction between those two things? Are we betting the farm on making the way of living of the Western middle classes in the early 21st century sustainable? And that sounds even more absurd now than it did in 2007. But still, as absurd as it sounds, that's still the logic behind a huge amount of the way that a thing like climate change is talked about. Hmm. I'm always interested in the answer to this question because it seems to me this is what we're we're sort of tiptoe perhaps tiptoeing around a little bit is that ultimately perhaps one conclusion of the whole clim climate change thing is that it's really what's going to end what we what we're terrified deep down what we're terrified in ending is not life because that's really an existential uh problem that humans have to deal with whatever right we're mortal um, what we're terrified of ending is, you know, being able to go on cruises, being able to uh, turn on our TV every night in our centrally heated apartments and go down to 20 different stores and buy what we like. We're terrified of modernity ending and climate change is almost like the problem we have to deal with because modernity is the central thing we want to keep going. So I will hand this horrible question over to you because it's almost been the question I've been trying to answer for however many years. What is modernity? So the story I tell in the book is that uh, if you want a really simple way of n noticing modernity, you can say modernity is the point at which it seems natural to certain people initially in Western Europe and later elsewhere to treat the fact that we live after our ancestors as the most important and best thing about us like modernity is the point at which you like once to, to define yourself as modern to think that's important enough that you start to turn it into an identity in the way that certain thinkers in france and elsewhere began to do in late 17th early 18th century is to consider your proximity to the future the defining feature of who you are and the way of living that you are a part of and what you stand for. And what this very simplistic definition allows you to do is to notice both the beginning and the ending of it. Mm -hmm. Because it then makes sense that this weird thing, postmodernism, shows up in the early 1970s, when on the one hand, you're sort of five years on from the failure of the hopes of 1968, and you know, by that kind of time afterwards, a lot of serious thinkers are beginning to recognize that more was in play than it felt like at the time in that year. And on the other hand, you've got your sort of 10 years into the new environmentalism, uh, the messages coming back from science are uh, seriously alarming and calling into question the assumptions and complacencies of industrial society and in the mix of all of that this ability to draw sucker from proximity to the future to treat the future as a vessel for collective hopes mm. which had somehow endured even you know world war one and world war two and uh, auschwitz and hiroshima and the rest of it because somehow all of that can get 
incorporated into the logic of progress because it becomes like all of the shit becomes more history to escape from. It's 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 kind of coming out of the tail end of the rocket, propelling us towards the future. Mm -hmm. But somehow by the early 70s, like the shell of the rocket was breaking apart, the the vessel mm -hmm. within which the future could serve as a vessel for collective hopes. And, you know, on the one hand, you had in seminar rooms in Paris, people coming up with this kind of these clouds of intellectual squid ink to to name that as they retreated from the streets to the seminar rooms. And on the other hand, you had Malcolm McLaren putting it more pithily as, you know, just no future. And after that, the future never really comes back. It comes back as a sort of privatized promise in the Thatcher era, the neoliberal era, where it's you against everybody else and where you have futures markets and where you know, a, the, your student loan is a bet on your own personal income in the future and the, your security is meant to come from having a mortgage on a house and house prices going up and so on. And that kind of papers over the cracks for a while until 2008. And when the global financial crisis hits for more and more people, you know, who aren't at the bottom of society, that even that version of the future is no longer serving, even that privatized, personalized version of it. And so you get these surveys that are showing by 2010 onwards that, you know, substantial majorities, two or three or four to one in pretty much all of the Western countries say that young people growing up today are going to have you know, struggle to have the kind of lives their parents had rather than have a better life than their parents, which is the definition of the failure of the promises of progress at the most mundane yeah. everyday economic level and so you know that if if that way of telling the story of modernity is true then we're sort of 50 years into the the sort of final failure of that but you know as john michael greer would tell us these are kind of 200 year processes these kinds of endings so 50 years is not necessarily halfway through one of the books you know for a book to be written, I've realized there often ha there are often other books that have to be written first that create the field within which this book can show up. Mm -hmm. And two of the ones that were particularly important for this one, one was A Small Farm Future by Chris Smage, which shows really convincingly by someone who's both a farmer and a you know, quantitative sociologist that you can get to a future by the mid 21st century even in a country like the uk even with climate change and migration being driven by climate change where the uk could be food self-sufficient through small-scale peasant agriculture and that, that might not be the worst world you could end up in the other book that was really important for it was vanessa machado de Oliveira's book hospicing modernity and even just the title of that the proposition there that what might be worth doing you know the work in the ruins in the title of my book is not trying to save modernity not trying to overthrow it or burn it down or have a revolution but trying to give it a good ending with as you know minimizing the damage allowing it to hand on the lessons that it might only realize at this stage yeah. um and so that's you know that's the kind of space within which i'm i'm Sort of inviting people to operate i guess it's interesting there as well you said that one of the one of the sort of the tenets of modernity and the myth of progress in a way is is to say you know to the next generation that you'll you'll have the bigger house the you know things will be better you know food will be cheaper petrol will be cheaper cars will be faster and more efficient you'll have the bigger house better faster more etc etc all quantifiable of course the one thing uh I've noticed, and I don't actually think this is a symptom because things are crumbling down. One thing I noticed in my generation was some people still completely adhered to that myth, most definitely. I mean, if if, if one if one wants to, or you know, if if one doesn't realize they are, then you can be forgiven for not realizing you're in the middle of something which is sort of programming you. But one thing I also realized is that a lot of people completely saw through that very quickly. And one thing modernity, I believe does is it doesn't really allow you to understand any other routes so you're just left in this strange no man's land of well it's not some you know the, it's you're left in this strange problem of uh 
well, okay, I know the future is not going to be better, but I didn't really want that anyway. You know, I didn't want the the five star two week cruise in the Mediterranean with the cruise ship, which now has a roller coaster on top of it. Um, but you're also not left with any space to really understand. Well, how do I go anywhere else? So um, maybe a question to ask you is how how do you begin to open up those spaces, and what do they even, you know, what does non modernity look like? Maybe we need to get, you know. This, you mentioned postmodernism. One thing I was going to say is postmodernism has always struggled with, it's always with like its horrible, horrible umbilical, umbilical cord to modernism, right? It can never get beyond it because, well, look, you're always tethered to it. So maybe we need to get beyond modern and postmodernism and just say, look, you're both a little era that we don't need anymore. Let's get back to choice. I remember, um, you know, gosh, nearly 25 years ago at university with, with Mary Harrington, who's writing for Unheard, mm. and um, she's got a book coming out called uh, Feminism Against Progress, which I'm really looking forward to reading. Um, but we were friends at university, and I remember, I think it was Mary who sort of summed up a whole vein of kind of um, postmodernism as we were encountering it, studying literature in the 90s at Oxford, of kind of let us now sit on the ground and tell sad stories of the death of meta narratives. <laughs> that there was a kind of a mourning for the promises of uh, and simplicities of modernity that you could no longer believe in, but nor could you quite imagine living without, mm. which is a sort of rather um, academic version of the same the same predicament in a sense. Um, I, one place I go with this in the book before leaving behind, because um, I agree that kind of umbilical connection it does does kind of it did end up crippling postmodernism as a proposition um but one place i go is to sort of notice that there are multiple um attempts at escape from or response to modernism and modernity um i don't really talk much about this one in the book but obviously there is a kind of 20th century european anti-modernism which mark sedwick Sed sedwick did a brilliant job of looking at in um against the modern world where he's kind of tracing traditionalism from the twenties onwards, you know, including the really dark paths to people like Evola and Dugin, but also, you know, um, the path that leads to sort of Kathleen Rain and the Temenos Academy in London, which uh, is a, a wonderful little pocket. So there's that current, and then there's the kind of Parisian um, postmodernism that is what we normally think of when we hear the word. And then there is this other thing that has always been much more interesting to me, which was named by Gustavo Esteva and Madhu Sui Prakash in the 90s as grassroots postmodernism in a book of that title. And I don't think the name is that useful necessarily, but what they're pointing to is there is another oh, critique of modernity and modernization processes that doesn't come from places like Paris and New York <laughs> and London that comes from uh, the experience of people and movements that have been on the receiving end of processes of modernization and can see through the promises from there. And this is the current that sort of links together people like Illich and Berger to the Zapatistas, um, to the movements that someone like Vandana Shiva in India um, has you know, been such an amazing voice for, and these are people who I've learned a lot from and spent a lot of time with, not least because there's a sobering quality that comes from getting into those kinds of conversations. If you're starting from a slightly melancholic, born too late, Western um, predicament, and you go, oh, fuck, like, yeah, with all of this, my life is dependent on things that I don't like to look at that are going on at the other end of the supply chains. And here are the people who are experiencing all of that, but who are also less helpless. Like this is one of the things that comes from Illich is to say like modernity and in industrial society produces the most helpless human beings the world <laughs> has ever seen. Mm. And there are still, you know, billions of people on this planet who are not helpless in the way that we are. Mm. And part of how the book ends is with saying, you know, in all the rooms I've been in where people are brought together to talk about climate change, there is this, assumption not always stated that the agency 
does or should lie with the kinds of people represented in those rooms. Mm -hmm. And I'm increasingly convinced that you know, that's just not the case, that if we are going to do a better job than it looks like of coming through all of this, then oh, it's not going to be um, the world's most modern people who uh, can you know, lead the way or have the answers or know what to do as things fall apart. It's people who are used to living with things falling apart, who have been through sort of five centuries of worlds ending as a consequence of modernity. And now we're at the point where the world of its winners is ending. Mm. And if we show up without thinking we're the ones who have to save everyone or save the planet or have all the answers and just show up with our own experience of kind of brokenness and helplessness and not knowing what to do next into those dialogues, things can start to, to happen. And what that looks like you know, includes, though it's not limited to, uh, beginning to become a bit less helpless in the places where we find ourselves, beginning to learn some stuff, you know, in a kind of acting as if way, without fooling ourselves that if the the systems we're dependent dependent on go away tomorrow, we would be these wonderful oh, self sufficient communities. We're not going to be that. We're going to be in a mess, and we're going to be improvising our way through that. But we can nonetheless be creating the conditions through stuff we're doing now to be people who show up with capacity rather than people who make things worse mm. in moments where systems fail or are in retreat. And, you know, I'm sitting in Sweden, which prides itself or has done on being the world's most modern country. And these days I think of it as the world's last modern country. Like the last place that's going to notice what is mm. actually happening because if the tide is going out then to be the most modern is to be the one who's stranded furthest up the beach mm. i'm about to set off on this tour to the uk to have all these conversations and meet people and take the book into the world and i'm really conscious that you know a lot of what i've just been talking about about things falling apart is further advanced in the UK than it is in Sweden, although the trends are in the same direction in both countries. Mm. You mentioned learned helplessness, and I'm, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with you that people are, are that, that, that that is the case. But to get people to um, understand in such a way that they need to be learning to help themselves, I mean, you could look at a book like Dmitry Orlov's Reinventing um collapse where this you know the, the fall of the soviet union and the fall of collapse of russia in that sense well those people had already understood that they had to fend for themselves to a certain degree and so they were already growing allotments and things of these this sort so it almost do you, do you see that you know what one thing of trying to teach someone something is one element especially within the modern world is why would i need to learn this and so is the task to a certain degree now is sort of proving to people like here's you know there's all these practical things we could be teaching people and s small laws or ideals that we could be getting rid of like to have a an allotment in your front garden you don't need the pleasant aesthetic lawn you know for instance start growing your own food it's not weird to do that or it's not weird to hunt game and get rid of all these strange sensibilities that we've got but it seems that the task there would still be to have a certain amount of proof to justify to people this this is this is all coming down because as far as i can see with the the price of petrol nah, about settling now but the the rising energy costs and these clear little markers which are happening they're still understood as little speed bumps on the on the way so we how do we go about um proving to people that we're you know that history still moves on history history is still happening I think that trying to convince people of what is going to happen is almost always, uh, you know, a losing bet. Mm. I think what's worth doing is, you know, finding people with whom to puzzle through this together. Mm -hmm. You know, finding people with whom to redraw your own maps because you can't do it single handed. You can do it to some extent from books. That was how I started. But then finding the others. And, you know, not having some kind of grand esoteric story about how you are the ones who really know, but <laughs> just uh, 
doing that kind of on the one hand the mapping work together and on the other hand practicing meaningful ways of showing up that are off the maps of the society that you grew up in so you know when i was living in london a good part of my energy was going into running this weird agency called space makers that i started that you know is kind of best known for taking over 20 empty shops in brixton village in the indoor market and doing this project that brought this space back into life by getting like about a thousand people over the course of a year in to take over shops and do temporary projects and events and so on and i you know i was not entirely proud of that work that we did there but what that allowed us to do because of the reputation it had was to do other projects that were more interesting to me off the back of that like starting a community owned and run street market in west norwood mm -hmm. and with that you know you would have people showing up at six o'clock on a sunday morning once a month to put up market stalls up and down the streets of west norwood unpaid having worked in their real jobs all week and i use, i always used to think now maybe those people always secretly had a burning desire to run a street market probably that's not what's going on probably it's actually that there is an experience of meaning that we're having together and i include myself in that in a project like that in an undertaking like that that is largely missing from our experiences of our workplaces our, our educational institutions etc and it's because uh, this is not you know i was also part of like anarchist social centers in my 20s um where we would have long meetings trying to decide whether or not we could allow a band to take money on the door of a gig to cover their petrol costs because they might make a profit this was not at some attempt at living in a pure way outside of the market economy it's literally a street market yet it's also a street market that wouldn't exist if all the work that went into making it happen had to be paid for mm -hmm. and that's the hack is that through creating something where people are putting their time and energy into it for their own reasons often because it's giving them a sense of being in place rather than just you know living in a room and commuting into the city to their job uh, you begin to get this experience that people are capable of coming together for reasons other than because we're paid to or told to do something and those are the logics of modernity the logic of the market i'm doing this because i'm being paid to and i need the money because otherwise i'll be homeless and the logic of the state i'm doing this because somebody who has power over me has told me to do this mm -hmm. the only reason why humans are around is because for hundreds of thousands of years we have been capable of doing things together for reasons other than because we're being paid to mm -hmm. or because we're being told to and those reasons have been more deeply saturated in meaning than either the market or the state tends to be and so for me you know loads of people have been to the west norwood feast not that many have had a conversation with me about like the thinking behind it or what i learned from it about you know this thing of coming together for reasons other than because we're being paid to or told to but we were doing that project partly to practice that and to build up the experience of that in the conviction that the more people who have that experience the more people who've been part of things and noticed the value in things that have that quality where you can bring more of yourself to the the work to the collaboration to the friendships that are formed there then it would be wise to bring to most workplaces or schools or whatever like the better condition we'll be in for handling the the, the further unraveling of this mess down the line and you can draw people into that because it's fun to be part of without them having to buy into some big story of you know, reinventing collapse or um whichever sort of theory of collapse you might hmm. might have it's interesting you know throughout all of this we started with science and we haven't even really said the word politics and it seems that the those two things sort of can't enter into the future conversations the future happenings that need to be happening you know politics and science have almost their limitations are met as we enter into this 
actual future. They've they've sort of science has its place, as you say, as a it seems to be like here's the data, but beyond that, science doesn't have value systems, it doesn't have morals, it doesn't have an understanding of the world, and and that's sort of what it's lied to us about. And both science and politics as these sort of neoliberal dream of you just say that word and everything's going to be sorted out, right? Science has got all the answers. It seems they've sort of been left at the door and we're entering, I don't know, I can't put a name on what we're entering into, but they don't, they don't really have a, they don't really have a place. Well, I get invited to talk to politicians sometimes. And I usually start by saying, I wouldn't want to be a politician in these times because there's a there's a story that i came across while i was working on the book that i like a lot have you come across a philosopher called federico campagna uh yeah 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 so he has i mean he's got a great book called prophetic culture recreation for adolescence and one of the things he's one of the stories he's telling is he says you know world's end Sometimes you begin to realize you've been born into the ending of a world. And um, part of how you notice that is that the future doesn't work, kind of what we've been talking about already. That tells you you're sort of at the end of the arc, at the end of the script of this world. This has happened before in other times and places. There may be particularly scary aspects to it in this turn of the cycle, but it's not the first time. So then he's like, well, what do you, what do you need to do? Or what's worth doing, let's say, when you realize that you're living at the end of a world? And the answer he gives, which I really like, is he says, I, stop worrying about making sense according to the narrative and the logic of the world that is ending. And start trying to make good ruins. Start mm -hmm. trying to leave behind things that may or may not turn out to be useful to those who come after. And... Uh, to me, that fits with why I've been drawn so much to working with um, artists and culture makers, um, because I think that there are, um, well, there are specific reasons coming out of the sort of ending of the world of modernity, why artists and culture makers are peculiarly well placed, which is that you know, modernity has tended to this kind of utilitarian logic where everything has to justify itself by being useful, by being economically rational. And then you've got this kind of native reservation, this enclosure within which culture, which, you know, from an anthropologist's point of view, is everywhere and everything human. But in modernity, culture becomes this little box inside these sometimes very privileged and often mostly very precarious institutions where the activity going on in there doesn't have to make sense in the same way that all of the other activity of a modern society is meant to make sense. It's part of what makes artists so offensive. It's part of why it's so easy to do tabloid news stories about modern art is precisely because in a world where everybody else is subject to, you know, often quite horrific surveillance and, you know, need to justify themselves economically, you can tell a story of these people who've been given grants to do these absurd things that you know, uh, look terribly self-indulgent. And some of that is, you know, frankly, crap art. But you can appropriate that role if you've recognised that you're living in this kind of condition that Campania is describing. Not only that, you can create something which exists as an institution within the world that is ending, but because it's an artistic or cultural institution, it doesn't have to make sense to that world, and therefore it can act as a portal through which people can cross backwards and forwards between the world that is ending and the unknown worlds that may just lie ahead. Mm. None of that is open to you if you are a politician. Like If you're a politician, you still have to act as if this world that is ending is as real and as full of future as it ever was. And lots of the kind of defamations and absurdities and obscenities of you know, politics of all flavors in recent times have to do with the impossibility of that task. And, you know, that's part of why so much political energy lies with people who, you know, at best are speaking to a sense of loss and at worst are wanting to just burn everything down or turn one group of people against another mm. is because that gets closer to being true to 
you know, living at the end of a world than a performance of what it was like to be a politician whilst the future still worked, which is what the sort of more mainstream and centrist um, politicians and even some of the kind of, you know, people who I have uh, a lot of time for on the left really end up doing in practice is kind of performing uh, and acting as if the future was still there within this world that is ending rather than you know rather than being able to find the moves by which you relinquish that in the way that federico is talking about mm. so there is some optimism there there's, some some hope. Hope. there's some hope there's some hope yeah, yeah. Some hope. yeah. i mean so illich would remind everyone that hope at its root means being open to surprise mm. and that you know you can see how that fits with uh you know making good ruins rather than attempting to secure the future continuation of this world and you know the other part of it is again you know, going back to illich apparently towards the end of his life he used to say the limit of political possibility today is the number of people who can sit around a table and share a meal together <laughs> And that sounds more pessimistic than it is as a statement because you know it doesn't specify any limit on the number of tables and it doesn't say that everyone needs to be sitting at the same table at each meal time but i think if you want to look for the beginnings of the political that comes after the ending of the world as we know it then you find it at that scale rather than at the scale that we've usually been taught to look for the political mm. and that's not simply a kind of an anarchist um sort of political analysis it's it's a sort of tactical and strategic analysis of what kinds of times are we in mm. that you know the seeds of what comes after are going to lie in things that didn't look significant enough to be worth crushing whilst there was still a lot of power and force and weight in the dying structures and institutions mm. Is there anything you'd like to add about your your book that you've uh, you feel we've overlooked? Oh, we've talked around quite a lot of it. I mean, I suppose the other thing that's worth saying is the the part of the book that some people are going to find most challenging is what I have to say about the pandemic. Mm. Um, mainly because it, I don't think it fits within any of the frames of the kind of COVID culture war that has played out over the last three years because what i'm saying there is you know we need to differentiate between this was this was framed for me very helpfully by a very strange man i know who amongst all the strange things he has done spent some time working with the u.s department of defense not least on pandemic flu strategy and in the first week of lockdown in the uk i had a call with him and uh, he said, I've realized something. A disease is when a person gets sick, but a pandemic is when a society gets sick. Mm. And I think that the sort of derangement that has gone on in one way or another for lots of us during the pandemic has to do with this paradox that we have a disease which at the human level, at the level of your body and my body and anyone else's body, is just not that bad. I mean, it's a nasty viral infection and you know if you're old or otherwise vulnerable then it can hit you very hard mm. but it's you know even klaus schwab of the world economic forum is on the record of writing you know this is um the least deadly pandemic the world has seen in 2000 years mm. and yet we had these measures taken against it that were you know more or less unprecedented in terms of the um, suspension of ordinary um, rights and liberties and um, the, just the interruption of human life within our societies. And I'm, again, I'm saying this from Sweden where the restrictions were much milder and coming from the UK and living in Sweden has given me a particular kind of quite visceral experience of the choices that were made by our politicians in response to the pandemic. And that's part of where the book starts from. But what I'm trying to say in it is we've gone slightly mad one way or the other 
because no one has talked very clearly about the fact that these measures were not taken to um, preserve, uh, they were not taken in response to the severity of the disease at a bodily level. Mm. They were taken in response to the severity of the pandemic at a societal level. And our societies are incredibly fragile. Yeah. Our societies are like people with damaged immune systems that can be knocked over by a disease passing through that a hundred years ago could have passed through without even being noticed. Yeah. You know, a hundred years ago in any society in the world, pretty much, if you had a year in which 10 or 20% more people died than in an ordinary year, and most of them were in their 60s, 70s and 80s, the only people who would have noticed would be the grave diggers and the priests. Mm -hmm. uh, once you have this situation, which again, Illich was seeing emerging in the 70s, of this kind of new form of scarcity that arises from the dependence on the professional provision of institutional commodities of care. You know, we no longer have the capacity either in terms of skills or time to care for the sick and dying within households and at the community level. You have to die really fast these days if you wanna die without passing through a hospital. Mm -hmm. And hospitals are very, very expensive the time of the people who work in hospitals is expensive, not least in terms of the years of training that goes into it. You cannot keep the extra capacity on hand, even in a really well-funded health service, and there aren't that many countries that have that anymore, to be able to cope with that kind of deviation from the norms. Mm. And that's why a disease which 100 years ago would hardly have been noticed instead becomes a paralysis of societies for months and years with all sorts of other consequences that we're only beginning to reckon with. And part of what I'm saying is, I, this isn't just like the pandemic wasn't a one-off. We're gonna be in a chain of crises and climate change is going to present us with versions of this as well. Mm. And if our response is about saving existing systems that are very vulnerable and fragile and big and expensive, then we're going to do that at the cost of, you know, locking down and suspending the life that makes our lives worthwhile in the name. I keep thinking of that American general in the Vietnam War who said you know, we had to bomb the village to save the village. And at some levels, you know, we had to stop. We had to bring life to a halt in order to save life mm. was kind of the the logic that uh, seemed apparently inarguable. Yeah. in the pandemic. And I'm not even saying that there was an obvious thing we should have done instead, because that fragility of our systems is real. Mm. But what I am saying is, you know, part of why this kind of resilience from below that we've been talking a bit about, and that I write a lot more about in the book, part of why it's necessary is because it's the only thing that's going to allow us to navigate the successive crises that lie ahead of us, without the response being increasing paralysis until you just get some kind of total systems failure. Hmm. There's a cheery note to end on. Yeah. No, I don't think it's it's too bad. I mean, people people don't like to be reminded of their mortality, and I think uh, it's the only thing we can't avoid. Yeah, quite. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, this is only just going to be published tomorrow. Uh, well, released tomorrow. So uh, this question is probably be a little bit frustrating. But where do you where do you go from here? Are you planning on writing something more, or is this somewhat of a maybe a you an end to a certain chapter? It's an end to a certain chapter. I mean, I'm writing on Substack, and that feels like a good space in which to navigate the sort of transition to what's coming next. Um, I had this sense of you know having put down a whole lot of material that I've been carrying. It's a bit like, you know, Stuart Lee, the comedian, says, uh, when you when you tape your show and do a DVD release, then you have to write the next show because you can't carry on touring that material. And there's a sense in which, you know, a lot of my work is standing up in front of rooms full of people and speaking. The sense in which it's doing the same thing to have written this book for me and releasing myself from the responsibilities that went with carrying that material. And, you know, what's what's clear to me is that there's a lot of stuff that's very live right now in my work and the conversations that I'm involved in that has to do with belief and um the you know 
I've done four four episodes four four episodes four series of the the Great Humbling podcast with Ed Gillespie, and the episode that people always talk to me about is the prayer episode mm. that we did. And I want to spend more time speaking and writing publicly about that kind of thing now, because I think it's part of what is actually called for by where I end up at by the end of this book. So I, maybe what's coming next is on our knees in the ruins. <laughs> well, I think more and more people will find themselves returning to faith. All the all the mm. all the reasons too are there. Um, it's just whether or not they they it's modernity has set up a certain mindset which is very uh hesitant to humble itself but uh whereabouts can we find uh, your whereabouts can we find your substack uh so i uh, i'm doogled.substack.com um and my website is doogled.nu um doogled d-o-u-g-a-l-d um basically i have a pretty unusual name so you can just google my name and you tend to find most of the stuff Mm -hmm. and i will put links for this book uh which once again thanks to chelsea green publishing for uh kindly giving me a copy and i'll put links um for where you can, people can purchase this book in the description below and links to your substack but um yeah Dougal Hine, it's been a great conversation thanks very much thank you james